Hello, hi, Jeff. Welcome. <laughs> hi, Doug. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to you, and uh, it's evening here. So yes, evening where in? Ah, uh, in the UK, in Cornwall. Yeah. Oh, you're in so Cornwall. It is, it is now uh, seven o'clock in the evening here. Yes, and it's eight a.m. here in Hawaii. Yeah, cool. On on the island of Maui. So, last time we spoke, you talked about. Um, the reason why you changed from eating fish to not eating fish and you know based on our subjects today about being separated from loved ones it would be lovely to hear that story again i'm not sure if we were we were recording last time when you were sharing that story i think we'd stopped by then <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um yeah, you know, yeah. You want me to tell you, tell it to you? <clears throat> Excuse me again. Actually, it's an interesting uh, thing because um, we're generally talking about separated from loved ones. So I thought I thought I'd have a look on uh, the web to see the definition of what love is. And I, I'll just read this to you. It says a profound, tender, passionate affection for another person. Well, I'll add and being. Uh, a feeling of warm personal attachment or deep affection, a strong affection for another arising out of kinship or personal ties. So it's referring from one human being to another. But I just see it so often in, in other species. It's, and, and, you know, if you take the time to look, you can, you can, you can just see it. It's, it's there. Um, so, for example, now... With uh, COVID, uh, I haven't seen much of my family through through all the last year. But the interesting thing about human beings is that we can still stay in touch. So we can we can Facebook, we can Zoom, we can telephone call, and we know that our loved ones, our friends, are okay. And and that's worth that's worth a lot. But wildlife can't do that. It's uh, at least not, not with any distance between them. And there were two examples of, of what made me think about relationships species have between themselves um, that, that made me rethink the family, the friend structure and other species. Have you got time for two stories? We have plenty of time. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Yeah, Zoom is timeless, right? Zoom is timeless. <laughs> it's absolutely true. So the first thing that really, the time it really struck me was, uh, it was, it was I was diving. We were making uh, a film of the underwater life of the South Coast here in the UK through the eyes of the seal. Very long, complicated story, which I won't go into. But at some point in that, we decided to put a big net across this little inlet. And that was gonna be part of the sequence and story. Didn't all work out. Um, the seal turned out to be really quite bullish. And, um, Cheeky. Uh, absolutely terrorized us actually. It was, it, it was an interesting summer. But at the point where I did, decided to pull in the net, I was just going along it. Um, just looking at it, and there in the bottom was uh, a blenny. Only about so long, and I could see it was all tangled up. And next to it, but free, was another blenny. And I watched them for a little while, and and the blenny, the blenny, the blenny that was free was obviously very agitated. So I came up really slowly to them and the free blending backed off a little bit. Because, you know, I'm a big predator, basically. But it didn't go too far. And it took me about hmm, five, six, seven minutes to very slowly and very gradually uh, untangle this um, little blending from net. And as I was doing it, the free blenny just came closer and closer and closer until he was in the company of the blenny that was that was under a lot of stress. And I couldn't believe it. 
I, I thought, you know, it should be, it should be scooting away. It should be afraid. And it wasn't. It came right in there. Anyway, I let, I, I managed to get it out, and uh, the the blending that was caught was was just recuperating, and the other one just came in, nudged it, and they just swam away together. I couldn't believe it. They stuck together and they edged the way back into the reef. I was absolutely dumbfounded. I mean, I had no idea small fish like blennies even had relationships. Or mates, right? Or mates. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you spawn into the water or, you know, you have no, no um, long lasting or, or relationship at all with your young. But here, was a definite caring relationship, and and yeah, it, it was like so that that introduced me, and that was many years ago. Introduced me to to what other species are doing and feeling, and we have no idea. We have absolutely no idea what's going on. So afterwards, you decided not to eat fish from that. Oh, uh, that was my <laughs> that was my turning point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I said, no, that's it now. Um, so the the net I bundled up and it's still in my garage now. It's it's under a bench somewhere. It's never been used again. And um, yeah, no, I, I can't touch seafood again now. So, well, but now, of course, yeah. things have changed hugely because not only on, on that personal level, I mean, just the fact that industrial sea fishing is taking a, a dramatic toll on our marine life it, it's it just doesn't make sense to eat seafood anyway yeah and even netting um i went for a walk the day before yesterday early in the morning you know around six six thirty i got down to the beach which is about a 15 20 minute drive from here and you know the sea turtles the big hawaiian sea turtles that are called hanu rest in the evening but if they're really tired, they rest in the daytime. Well, this area is also populated by a lot of humans. When I came upon this one male turtle, you know, normally I walk by and I kind of see, are you okay? Because I've interacted with a lot of them in the water where they have hooks or mm. different fishing device. This one had fishing netting wound so tight around his left front flipper that it was, you could tell it was cutting the circulation. And, yeah. you know, I, it's a, an offense here. It's a you know, like three to $5,000 fine to touch an endangered sea turtle. And to me, I know the law, you know, I used to be a marine mammal volunteer. So I used to deal with rescue animals, but I thought, you know, the law is one thing and injured animal is another thing. You know, as long as I'm not causing additional stress. So I just, you know, they don't like anyone obviously touching them. But he also had the netting from his flipper into his mouth. So I'm mm -hmm. thinking he had a hook caught in his mouth. And so I didn't bring, normally I have like my little clippers that I bring snorkeling. I didn't have anything to cut away. So I used a little coral rock to try to loosen everything and, there was no one on the beach at this time. And it, finally a guy passed by and I said, can you please call the turtle rescue? And so it took him a while, but the, the turtle started to get upset when he got closer. He was, he was a male turtle and they are sensitive to who's, who's the other person, you know, around them. Cause yeah, I just, absolutely. yeah. Like, to we talked a little bit last week about what gives value to and I don't I really want to stay on being separated from loved ones but what gives value to animals why do we differ from animals to the human animal if we're a part of the animal kingdom why do you think that is <laughs> Yeah, the thing, the thing with human relationships is it, I, I'm not sure where it comes from. And I'm, I mean, I, I think part of it is self-serving. 
So there's a, obviously a lot of biological things going on between uh, mothers and babies and children. Fathers as well, to a degree, um, but it does, it is self-serving in, in the fact that you want the species to continue. And of course, during that process, you also love your children, or at least in most cases anyway. Although, you know, the human race does some appalling things to, to other people, you know, with taking children, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If it, in fact, just, a, just an example on the animal side of that, I was spending a long time in the Congo uh, doing Eastern and Western lowland gorillas. And the whole trip started off with um, the uh, orphanage for, for baby gorillas. And I went there and I was kind of slightly naive about it all. And I just had such fun with these baby <laughs> gorillas. Yeah, I mean, they were all over the place. They looked happy. Um, they were being fed, they were being taken care of. And that's all I thought of it, fantastic. Then I got out right into the central Congo, into the swamps, finding uh, wild gorillas. Took a long time, but gradually um, we got to this slightly habituated group and spent a lot of time with just one family. And in that family was the mother, the great silverback, uh, a couple of kids and a baby. And we gradually, they got used to us, we got used to them, they ignored us, et cetera, et cetera. And then one day I saw a silverback go into, the, into some undergrowth and I thought, I'm going to follow him in. Actually, I'm not going to follow him in. I'm going to go in the other way and see what he's doing. And I had no concept at all of being afraid of, uh, of this gigantic animal. I mean, it's so strong and so powerful. And so I got down on my hands and knees. I couldn't take my camera in. There wasn't room. And I, I, I crawled into this light little tunnel uh, uh, into the undergrowth. And there lying down with his, with his chin on his uh, hand. And he was just watching me come towards him. And I got to within about five, six, seven feet. And I thought, okay, that's close enough. I mean, let's, you know, let's not push it. And he just totally ignored me, he just looked. And then he rested back on his arms. <laughs> and he, and he, had his, he was looking up and then suddenly this baby comes out of the, the other side and just jumps on his chest and then jumps all over his head. And I thought, I don't have a camera. It doesn't matter. It's okay. It's okay. And, you know, he just lay there and you could see he loved it. He loved his baby. It was fantastic. And while the baby was clambering all over him and pulling and stuff, he just... He just turned his head towards me and just raised an eyebrow. And I thought, oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> this, this is something I, I am never going to forget. And there, to me, was just how another species just care uh, for the family. And when they're, when they're then separated through hunting uh, or capture for zoos or whatever, it's, it's traumatic for them. It's, You're making me tear up. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, and it happens to so, to so many species. I mean, yeah. just simple things. We've got a dove here at the moment. Sorry, I have a pigeon. And <laughs> you can call him a dove. I'm like, uh, I, uh, <laughs> yeah. He's been sat on the bird table here for two days, and I know... He or she, I'm not sure which it is, has just lost her, her his partner. <clears throat> and for weeks now, they've just been flying around and, and, you know, they coo and all the rest of it and they eat and they're, they're all together. And now one of them's gone. Could be to anything, don't know. Could be shot, uh, could be to a bird of prey, anything. The difference in this pigeon is extraordinary. It is so depressed. Mm. It just sits there. And it's not eating much and it just walks around 
And it's oh just my another, gosh. It's just <laughs> another example for me. Yeah, I, I, yet another animal. And I see it all the time with with so many different things. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm That's like, okay. I'm afraid to give you any more examples. 